Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna just give everybody a few more minutes to trickle in and then we will go ahead and get started. I uh, hope everyone had a good long weekend if you're based out of the US. All right, I think we'll just go ahead and get started with some opening comments. I wanna make sure that we uh, have plenty of time for our presentation and our guest speaker today. So uh, for those that I haven't met before, it looks like there's a lot of familiar faces on uh, currently, but my name is Niki Kazahaya. I'm the community manager here at SafeGraph. Um, just looking forward, I wanna make sure we have a couple of events on everybody's radar. We do have another knowledge series event. I believe it's the fourth installment uh, of that series coming up on September 13th. We'll be having Jenny Doan up with the SafeGraph product team uh, come lead a seminar for us. So for those who haven't attended our knowledge series, these are sessions usually led by our SafeGraph product team members uh, with a focus on refining valuable skills for data scientists. So in our upcoming event, Jenny will show you how to better understand customer demographics, develop context around store performance, and compare trends against competitive businesses. I'll just drop that link in the chat here in a few minutes. Um, another Chit Chat Research event coming up on September 3rd with Karen Tan of Indiana University. Uh, she, will be re she will discuss research that explores how SafeGraph data can be used to estimate customer loyalty. She will present on key findings on how customer loyalty can influence persistence of company performance, spend on capital investment, and trading decisions and forecasts. So I'll be sure to drop that in, in the chat and I'll also follow up with everyone that's uh, on the call today with a lot of this information as well. So. Uh, just very quickly to go over the format for anyone that's new uh, to attending our Chit Chat research events. Uh, here in a few minutes, I will go ahead and introduce our guest speaker and pass it off to Elisa. Uh, she will run through her presentation. However, we always love it when people interrupt with questions. Um, so don't feel like you need to reserve them until the very end. Uh, but we will also have plenty of time at the end for questions as well. So um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today. So uh, Elisa Long is an Associate Professor of Decisions, Operations, and Technology Management at UCLA Anderson, and was previously on the faculty at the Yale School of Management. Her research spans topics in healthcare operations, including epidemic control, hospital resource allocation, breast cancer decision-making, and most recently, nursing home staff networks during the COVID pandemic. She teaches courses on data and decisions and healthcare analytics, and has received several teaching and research awards. She earned a PhD in Management Science and Engineering from Stanford and a BS in Operations Research from Cornell. So thank you so much for hopping on today. Elisa, I'll pass things off to you. Thank you so much. And it's, um, it's great to be here. Uh, as Nikki mentioned, um, as Nikki mentioned, um, I, my name is Elisa and I'm faculty at UCLA. Uh, and please feel free to stop me. I'll do my best to monitor the chat um, or feel free to uh, if I don't notice it and you have a question, feel free to interrupt um, as we go. This is some very recent research that I've done in collaboration with my colleague Keith Chen, also at UCLA, and our former colleague Judy Chevalier looking at uh, nursing home staff networks. And I'll describe kind of how we were able to utilize uh, mobility data to, to look at these questions. So I think, you know, of course, most of us have been following the pandemic um, um, in recent time, uh, recent weeks. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, or aren't maybe aware of this, COVID really is resurging in nursing homes. So if you look at, um, and this is as of the end of August, um, on the right, the number of cases and the number of deaths among residents of nursing homes on the top and on the bottom, uh, the same figures for staff members. So we saw, of course, you know, this huge peak in cases occurring at the end of 2020, kind of before the first wave of vaccinations uh, um, occurred. But we actually saw, again, a big kind of tick up in cases, both among residents and staff, um, just in the last two or three months. Um, to date, we've had about 600, over 600,000 cases in nursing home residents and another 600,000 or so among staff. Um, they represent about 2% of all COVID cases nationwide in the US and about 20% of all COVID deaths. Uh, and if we look at sort of vaccination rates, um, the CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, provides really detailed data actually down to the individual nursing home. You can go on their website and search and see um, what proportion of residents and staff have been vaccinated at a particular facility. 
Um, this, this graph on the left just shows aggregate vaccination rates by state within uh, nursing homes for, for staff members. So Hawaii is leading the country at about 90% vaccination coverage. Uh, some states in the South, like Louisiana, Florida, and Missouri, um, are below 50% um, vaccination coverage. And this sort of uh, lack of vaccination coverage is really what has what prompted the federal government to issue new guidelines um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, President Biden announced that nursing homes are now going to be financially penalized if their staff members are not vaccinated. Um, of course, this is going to lead to um, some potential implications. Um, there's already a lot of shortage uh, of staffing of, of qualified nursing and nursing aides in um, these facilities, and so this will likely lead to additional um, shortages. Uh, I want to kind of tell, go back in time a little bit to the start of the pandemic. Back in February and March of 2020, um, the first kind of really known outbreak in a skilled nursing facility was in a, in a facility in King County, Washington. Uh, that uh, was This particular facility was linked to over 160 cases, including more than 100 among residents, 50 among staff, and 16 among visitors. And after this outbreak occurred, this uh, the CDC actually launched an investigation to sort of look at um, where were the likely, what was the likely source of the, these infections and kind of where did it spread from here? Uh, and they used a lot of genomic testing in order to link this. Uh, this, this graph on the right from May of last year um, depicts kind of the spread from nursing home to nursing home. So this uh, focal facility is what they call facility A. It had some known um, COVID cases as of February 2020. And then they show sort of the time series um, connecting this facility to subsequent nursing home facilities through either um, a shared healthcare worker or patient transfers. And you could sort of see as time progressed how um, facilities that were connected to this focal one or connected to its connections um, became uh, vulnerable to, to COVID infections themselves. Given this, the CDC um, in their report actually indicated that staff members who work in more than one facility were a likely risk factor in the spread of COVID among uh, nursing homes. And, and yet there were no kind of federal guidelines or policies in place to help reduce this. Uh, this is really what kind of motivated our study is we wanted to better understand kind of what is the, the contributing factor of these shared staff networks uh, and what would happen if we could potentially eliminate them. Um, so to give you kind of a broad research overview um, of, of our study, and we, we published this earlier this year, if you're interested, um, I invite you to take a look at the full paper. Uh, the first kind of research question is we wanted to first estimate how connected are these nursing homes to one another. And for this, we're going to rely on the GPS um, location data to identify more than half a million phones that entered um, at least one nursing home um, over an 11 week period uh, in 2020. Then we're going to use that information to construct a network of the likely staff connections and then calculate a number of very standard network measures, things like degree, strength, um, et cetera. Uh, the second part of this question is then we want to take that connectedness and see how predictive is that of COVID cases. So in other words, are, are nursing homes that are more connected to other facilities, are they more vulnerable to have a COVID outbreak? And to do this, we're going to rely on two um, empirical specifications, and I'll go through this a little bit more in detail. Um, the first is, what we, is was what's called a cross-section regression. This is where we're going to predict the number of COVID cases based on a nursing home's uh, connectivity, as well as a number of other covariates, things like the number of beds, um, quality ratings, demographics, et cetera. And then secondly, we're going to do something called a time series regression, where we're going to actually try to look at kind of outbreaks appearing in a temporal manner and see, do we see a pattern between uh, nursing homes that are connected and it's and their and their kind of neighboring um, uh, nursing homes, do we see a subsequent uh, outbreak occur um, a short time later? Um, and Nikki, I think, just posted the, um, the link to the paper. Thanks, Nikki. OK. Uh, so a little bit of background on staffing in nursing homes. Um, for, uh, like for, for many people, you, know, you may not, not be familiar with this. I certainly didn't know anything about staffing in nursing homes before this project. Um, and I was really alarmed to discover how much 
the staffing needs fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is largely because, of course, um, the resident census or the number of residents on any given day in the nursing home can fluctuate. And there's also regular staff absences. As a result, even before the pandemic, about 60% of nursing homes relied on staffing agencies. So these are kind of part-time or temporary workers, typically nurses and nursing assistants that are um, employed on an on-call basis. So if a nursing home has a shortage and needs to bring in three people on a given day, they rely on a, a staffing agency to help them. Um, it's been well documented that understaffing can lead to poor service and regulatory violations. And by that, I mean that the, there's minimum staffing laws that vary state by state. So this is a heavily regulated industry. Um, for example, in my home state of Cal in California in 2018, uh, a law was passed that increased the required number of contact hours with staff members from 3.2 to 3.5 hours per day. This was something actually when um, then uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris was um, in California, she kind of helped lead the charge in uh, in increasing some of these quality control measures within nursing homes. And nursing homes basically face financial penalties if they fall below this threshold. Uh, in any time, in kind of any ordinary time, having um, such guidelines might be good practice because it's been shown that this more contact hours can increase um, quality of care for, for um, the residents. But of course, during a pandemic, maintaining these required number of contact hours means that agencies are going to have to rely more and more on things like staffing um, agencies or part-time workers, which of course can increase the chance of um, transmission occurring. In addition to those uh, temp workers, uh, nursing homes also make frequent use of contract workers. So things like hospice providers, occupational therapists, hairstylists, et cetera, they're typically not employed solely by one nursing home. They might float around in a particular community, spend one day in one facility, another day in another facility. And uh, finally, even the full-time workers often uh, combine employment across multiple homes. So perhaps it's not surprising with the median um, US nursing assistant salary of about $29,000, many of them are forced to work multiple jobs. Um, a study in the US found about 20% of nursing assistants hold second jobs. And a study out of Canada found, again, about uh, a quarter of all nursing home aides um, work in multiple homes. Uh, so it's sort of the perfect storm for thinking about how um, COVID might spread through this network. Um, so our first challenge in conducting this study was getting consistent COVID data. Um, for, so for this, we relied on a couple different data sources. Um, the first is the CMS database of, again, regulated nursing homes. So um, just to be clear, we're focusing here on what are called skilled nursing facilities or SNFs, also known as nursing homes. There's about 15,000 of them um, in the US. Um, we're not looking at other long-term um, congregate facilities. So things like senior living or independent um, facilities or so forth. I think that would be a really interesting context. It's just not regulated by CMS in the same way that SNFs are. Um, and so getting the data on kind of where the facilities are and so forth would be, would be much harder. But we rely on the CMS data to obtain um, each nursing home's address, as well as a number of other metrics like um, quality ratings. Um, they typically do these um, periodic random inspections to look for things like um, infection violations um, or other, making sure that the, the, the facility is following um, certain protocols. Um, even with this data, of course, there's no data on staffing linkages. So there's no central database on, you know, the, um, Nurse A is working in this facility on Mondays and this facility on Tuesdays. Like that, that level of data just doesn't exist. Um, so, so that's where we're going to rely on cell phone data um, to help help us there. Um, in terms of the COVID cases, the additional challenge we had was CMS um, required all nursing homes to report um, total COVID cases by May 17th of last year. Um, of course, you know, given that everything that was happening at the time, there was not perfect compliance immediately. Several nursing homes took a while to, um, to get their systems up in place to do this. 
but there were also no standardized guidelines on how to report the cases. So should they be cumulative um, or just that week's count? And if they are cumulative, how far back in time do they go? Um, so there was just a lot of noise in the reporting um, to CMS. This has since, of course, um, gotten better, but at the start of the pandemic, um, there was a lot of a lot of noise here, um, and so as a result, we decided to hand assemble um, data from about 22 states that where the state themselves kept very detailed um, nursing home level COVID cases, either on a daily or a weekly basis. So um, we we present results for both the CMS um, full data as well as kind of the, this individual state data um, for a subset of states. Um, our second big challenge, and, and hopefully kind of the reason why many of you all are here, is um, how do we actually identify a nursing home visit? So th this was really the, the crux of our analysis. Um, and for this, we actually relied on smartphone location data from Viraset. So Viraset um, is sort of one of the um, kind of raw data providers that SafeGraph uses um, that were kind of previously um, more closely connected and it is now spun off. Um, and, and just to distinguish this, if we think about most safe graph um, data, like the places data, it's, it's kind of aggregated data. So it's, you know, how many visits to a point of interest in this particular county occurred in the last week. Um, this is a little bit different. So this is actually kind of the raw smartphone um, ping data. Um, the full data set includes about 50 million smartphones in the US. Uh, 300 million smartphones worldwide, and it generates a huge amount of data. So on the order of 5 billion observations per day. Um, each observation or ping um, reports that unique smartphone ID, and this can be connected across purchases, um, the operating system, the timestamp, uh, the lat and lo longitude of where that phone was, and then an accuracy measure. So it's really um, quite, quite granular, um, this particular data. And we found in some related work that this data are really most powerful when they're matched with some other data sets, in particular using other kind of locations for inference. So in some related studies, um, my, my colleague um, Keith Chen wrote actually one of the kind of the first papers that used smartphone mobility data. Um, and he looked at, uh, it was this really clever um, analysis where they looked at um, following the divisive 2016 election, do families that were likely cross-partisan, meaning one family member was likely from a Democrat um, region and one was from a Republican region, um, did they have a shorter Thanksgiving duration um, in 2016 compared to prior years? Um, and they do find evidence of that. Uh, and then more recently, he and I um, also wrote a paper looking at political partisanship with regard to hurricane evacuations. So we use the smartphone data to, to kind of estimate how many people evacuate, how quickly do they evacuate, focusing on um, hurricanes Harvey and Irma mostly. Um, and we find a big um, wedge in sort of partisan um, evacuation behavior. Um, in the present study, of course, we're combining the, the geolocation data with nursing home locations. Um, um, let me just pause real quick a couple of questions. Will the presentation slides be made available? Uh, I'm not sure if they'll be made available. I believe the recording will be made available. Uh, and the Viraset data, um, so, so it is available, but there's basically a data sharing agreement. It's, it's not um, freely available. So, so for those of you that are interested, um, of course, you can, you can um, reach out to, to um, Viraset to discuss that. Okay. Uh, so let me give you kind of a sense of then how we take this raw ping data and translate that to nursing homes. So this, this shows you kind of a snapshot of a rooftop of a nursing home. So the, the building itself is outlined in red and um, we use um, the Google API to, to basically take that rectangular or that um, red, red shape and generate what's called like the convex hull. So basically uh, the yellow polygon is the, is the kind of the smallest shape around the red rooftop that would encapsulate that building. Um, and we, we use that as sort of our criteria to say whether or not a smartphone appeared in this facility or not. We apply some additional filters. So, you know, we wanna make sure that we try to avoid um, sort of, you know, some, some person walking down the street and the ping just sort of throws off um, a GPS location in the building. So, 
we require that um, the smartphone produces at least three pings with, within the building um, and that the smartphone spends at least one hour inside in a given day to sort of count as entering the building. Again, that's to sort of eliminate things like you know delivery drivers coming off to drop off a package for five minutes and then leaving. Somebody like that would not enter. Um, we would consider that not an, an entrant in our building. Um, I should mention too, we're, we're exploiting um, a policy change that happened. So as of March 13th in 2020, CMS, again, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they issued a nationwide lockdown on nursing homes. So at, as of March 13th, um, no visitors were allowed to enter uh, nursing homes, except for some compassionate compare, care situations. So basically any phone that appeared as, inside the facility was either a resident or a likely staff member, contract worker, temp worker, um, et cetera. So in the end, our final sample ends up being about 500,000 smartphones. Um, to give you a sense of kind of how frequent we see them, again, over this 11 week period, a smartphone returns to a particular facility on average on 16 different days. And about 5% of smartphones enter more than one facility. Um, so again, 95% of phones are only going to one facility um, over this period, but it's this 5% that we're really interested in sort of seeing where do they go, how connected are they um, as a possible um, mode of transmission for COVID. Uh, let me... Um, Michael had a question, do I use EV scan or any other sort of algorithm to cluster individual pings into a visit? So this is a really good question. We, we spent a lot of time thinking about kind of the time series of a phone kind of entering the facility. Like, do we want, you know, do we want to count sort of the number of hours spent in, in a facility as, um, as, you know, as like a, a measure of strength? Um, and we explored that a little bit. The challenge with, with something like this is um, a lot of it depends on the user's preferences and practices. So, you know, many people will disable location services if their phone is not on. You know, some people, it'll continue to ping in the background. So you take an example of, let's say, a worker who, who shows up to work in the morning, let's say at the start of an eight-hour shift, and they put their phone in their locker, and then they don't refer to it again until the end of their shift. We, it may not be generating a continuous set of pings, and so how do we attribute kind of the time spent there? So we tried to be somewhat agnostic on the time element and, and instead just say, okay, if you meet this filter, meaning the phone has been in the facility for at least an hour, it generated at least three pings, we're gonna call that a visit. And we're not gonna differentiate between a phone that spends you know, three hours versus eight hours. Of course, it, you know, in an ideal world, we'd like to, um, but to, as a first pass, we're, we're just focusing on that. We have thought about in sort of some um, future work about trying to kind of detect what type of worker this is. So can we look at the time series of kind of when do you tend to come and go from a facility to classify you? It's kind of an interesting classification problem, you know, to classify you as full-time worker, temp worker, you know, et cetera. Um, but we haven't, we haven't explored that yet. Um, Abigail had another question. Do we have any idea of how this sample of 500,000 smartphones compares to the ground truth data and SNF staff censuses? So it's a great question. So we, back at the envelope, um, from my understanding, there's about 1.5 million nursing home residents in the U.S. and on the order of four to five million um, nursing home staff members in the U.S. So ballpark, there's about six million people. Um, now, of course, Many of the residents, and when you think about the resident population, they're probably the population of all Americans that are least likely to have a smartphone. Um, so, you know, even though smartphone penetrance in the US is above 80%, among nursing home residents, it's probably much lower. Um, but our best guess is that maybe this is a 10% sample or so. Again, I should say, you know, we're only focusing on this 11 week period. So, you know, um, it, it, for people that were either um, not working during that period of time, or they um, weren't bringing their phone in or so forth, um, it, it probably is an undercount of, of the people actually entering um, the facility. And again, it's only smartphones. So if you have an kind of an old school flip phone or something that doesn't um, have smartphone capabilities, we, you would also not be included. Um, 
Okay, so from this data, then we start to see a network emerge. Um, and when I say network, you know, I'm thinking about kind of a classic network, whether it's like social media or, or other types of networks where we have nodes and edges. Nodes in this case correspond to each of the nursing homes or facilities um, in the continental US and the edges represent the pairs of facilities. Um, from, from the data that I just described, we can construct a contact matrix. So think of this as a matrix where each element is either one or zero. There's a one if a smartphone appears in both facilities I and J. Um, and then we can further weight this matrix based on the number of facilities, the number of smartphones appearing in both of those facilities. Um, so another way to sort of think of this as for every node or for every nursing home, we can calculate these four metrics. So the first, the simplest one is what's called the degree. Um, this is just how many other nursing homes are you connected to? And by connected, I mean, you have at least one shared worker or shared smartphone that, that was found in both of your facilities. Um, then the weighted kind of version of that is what's known as strength. So this is not just um, how many nursing homes are you connected to, but it's how many smartphones um, appear in your facility and at least one other nursing home facility over this 11 week period. Um, there's something called WAND or weighted average neighbor degree. This looks at all of your kind of direct neighbors. So the facilities that you're connected to, what is their average degree weighted based on the strength of the connection. And then the last one is something called the eigenvector of centrality. So this is a very standard measure, again, in network theory. It's kind of the basis behind like Google's PageRank algorithm. It basically, um, it's a measure of how important is this facility in the overall network. Um, and so we normalize this to be a number between zero and one. So it's not necessarily the facilities that have the most connections, but it's the facilities that are connected to other important or other highly connected facilities. So, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, the Kevin Bacon of, of nursing homes, like how, you know, how many, every actor can be connected back to Kevin Bacon within like six steps. It's sort of like that. We're looking at how important is, is this particular um, focal facility in the broader network, again, within the, within the state. So let me, let me, I think it helps to sort of illustrate this um, with, with an example. Uh, so returning to our um, outbreak that happened early on in King County, Washington, this was this facility called the Life Care Center in Kirkland. Uh, here I'm showing you a network that we've constructed. Um, the blue, the bright kind of blue circle or node sort of towards the center, that's the Life Care Center. So that's what we refer to as the hub in this kind of small network. The dark gray circles are its direct connections. So those are facilities that we see a smartphone appear in both the life care center and the dark gray um, facility. And then the light gray are the neighbor's neighbors. So anybody who's connected to one of the dark gray nodes. The size of the circle here represents the number of COVID cases. Here, this is the data, the CMS um, um, numbers, which again are a little bit noisy, but we also again have numbers um, on kind of the individual state level that we look at. And then lastly, the, the color of the edges or the lines between the different circles, um, that represents the number of contacts that we observe in both facilities. So many of these contacts just share one smartphone. Occasionally, we start to see more smartphones that appear in both facilities again over this time period. What I want to draw your attention to, though, is not the life care center. So we know the life care center itself had 160 um, plus cases. It was one of the er kind of the early um, outbreaks that occurred. When you look at when you look at its summary stats. So again, degree is the av the excuse me, the number of other facilities it's connected to. So it's connected to seven other nursing homes. Um, a strength of eight is the number of smartphones um, that appear in one of those other facilities. The, the weighted average neighbor degree is the weighted average of those neighbors. And then the Eigen score um, of 0.17, again, this is a number between zero and one. Um, a zero is this is totally unimportant, uh, an unimportant node in the network. A one is this is very central to the network. So 0.17 is on kind of the slightly lower side of things. But if I draw your attention to two other nodes, so from the blue node, if you go towards the upper left, there's two dark gray nodes kind of in the center of a little um, hub. And, uh, and we see these are these two other facilities called Garden Terrace and Marysville that are also in, in the same county. And when you look at their summary stats, they, you know, on average, they're connected to 
uh, excuse me, they're connected to 25 and 23 other facilities themselves. They have high strength, they have a high weighted average neighbor degree. And importantly, their eigenvector in the case of Garden Terrace is one and is 0.98 for Marysville. So that's virtually the highest in this state. Um, so these two nodes, these two facilities themselves are just so central to the network. And you see Life Care Center was themselves connected to these two. So where the outbreak um, originated, it's, it's hard to say. I don't know the exact mapping of the genetic um, testing that that other study did, but regardless, it's, it's, it's really not surprising that we see this level of connection and vulnerability for something like the Life Care Center when they're connected to these kind of super connected nodes. The, um, I should also point out, if you look carefully at the photos, um, of the three facilities, you'll notice something in common uh, that they all that they all kind of have this same general logo. So it's it's most likely the case that they share a parent company. Um, we you know we we also explored that a little bit to try to look at can we see some similar or shared ownership structures and how that might um, relate to the network. Um, it's it's really hard to get that data. There's CMS doesn't have again a central data set. A lot of nursing homes are owned by. Um, you know, like private equity shops and others. So even though they might share a parent company, they may not be as closely linked as some um, like in this case, but that is likely also contributing to some of the shared staff um, that's occurring between, between these facilities. Um, when, we, when we kind of look at other networks then, we see very different patterns emerge. So these are just three illustrative networks um, in three different locations. The first one on the left is in Alabama, the middle one is in California and the one on the right is in Florida. And I'm just providing again, some summary stats. We see for each one of these, again, the blue node is the kind of hub node or the focal facility. The dark gray nodes are its neighbors. The light gray nodes are its neighbors' neighbors. Um, and you just see really a, a lot of heterogeneity in connectivity. Um, in, in some place, in like California, for instance, you start to see these kind of pockets emerge where you know, you might have a cluster of nursing homes that are connected here and another cluster over here and they share a common link um, or several common links. Um, when we were looking at homes in Florida, basically the picture looks like this everywhere. It's, it's just like a bowl of spaghetti. I mean, there's so many shared connections happening um, among nursing homes in Florida. Uh, one other one I'll mention is this is um, a facility in, in Georgia um, called the Winder or Winder Healthcare and Rehab Facility. Um, this was a facility, again, in blue that had a big outbreak early on, over 200 COVID cases among residents. Um, it's highly connected. It's connected to 34 other um, nursing homes, a high strength. Interestingly, it, its eigenvector was only 0.56, so it's not even the most important one in the state of Georgia. Um, and I and I dug into it a little bit more. I went to their website just recently, and it was interesting because they say, you know, resident care comes first. That's their that's their sort of big tagline. If you go to the CMS um, website again, as of late August, um, about 82% of residents had been vaccinated, um, yet only 62% of staff had been vaccinated. So, you know, you, you when you look at a facility like this, that is so highly connected and you combine it with poor vaccination um, rates, it's just, it's a kind of a, a disaster waiting to, um, waiting to happen. Um, this, this shows you kind of the broader picture for the entire state of Georgia. So here I'm just focusing on this one facility and it's kind of um, direct network. This is if I look at all nursing homes um, in the state of Georgia, um, we, we start to see that this facility is not just an outlier, that we're seeing highly connected facilities across the state. Um, I'll point out that these kind of things that look like moons orbiting kind of the outside of the figure, these are nursing homes that we don't see any connections to other facilities. It doesn't mean that there's, that we're, that there's absolutely none there. We just don't see it in the smartphone data over the period of time um, that we're looking at. Okay, so let's get to some results. So um, this is just some summary stats of, of the different um, nursing homes, either using the CMS, the full data set for all facilities or these 22 um, states that, that we were able to um, explore. So we, we um, include things like very, um, various demographics, like if there's a high proportion of black residents, a high proportion on Medicaid, um, whether it's in an urban location or not, if it's a for-profit status, a for-profit home or not. 
Uh, CMS, again, provides some regulatory numbers, so the number of beds that the facility is approved for, a quality rating or a star rating from one to five, um, based on a number of, of criteria and whether or not they've had prior infection violations. And then at the bottom, I have our four net network measures um, that we're summarizing. Again, on average, um, each home is connected to about seven other homes uh, on, and about eight to nine um, um, individuals or smartphones appear in that facility and another facility um, and so on. So this, this summarizes what's called the degree distribution. So it's showing kind of how connected um, each facility is among, house, among homes that had COVID or did not have COVID, again, as of May 2020. So for instance, in among nursing homes that did not have any COVID outbreak at that point, they're on average connected to 5.6 other homes versus 7.8 homes if they did have COVID. So we see a statistically significant difference um, in both um, the average degree and the strength. Um, the, the first kind of, and I'll try to kind of walk through this as, as um, quickly as I can, but the first regression that we ran is trying to, again, predict the number of cases in a nursing home. And we're regressing this on these network measures, um, degree, strength, weighted average neighbor degree, and eigenvector, as well as a number of other covariates. So this is just in sort of a way of kind of unpackaging how much do these network measures contribute to the predicted number of cases in a home, controlling for things like the quality rating from CMS, infection violations, for-profit status, um, some other demographics, and then something called state fixed effects. That's gonna be an important control because we want to, we want to sort of account for the fact that during this period of time, this state might've also been employing things like lockdown orders, you know, restaurant restrictions, mask mandates, et cetera. So we want to kind of unbundle that and make sure we, we account for that. We do also test for um, what are called county level fixed effects, which is a much kind of stronger set of controls and our results um, are, are not, um, do not change. Um, so this is our first main table of regression results. Um, uh, so the way that we interpret this is, you know, for each column is a separate regression, and our um, our dependent variable here is the number of cases. We're doing a, a transformation here. The, this is just the inverse hyperbolic sign because um, cases can be zero. So this is a, a, a standard kind of transformation. Our independent variables are on the left, so degree, strength, weighted average neighbor degree, eigenvector, as well as some others. And then we have the coefficients are the main sort of number in the in the center of the table. Um, with a standard error in parentheses, and then the stars indicating the level of statistical significance. So, so things that have three stars in this case are highly statistically significant, meaning, you know, for as I increase, let's say, a, a nursing home's um, degree, its predicted number of cases increases. Um, and that's true for any of these network measures. Um, what's interesting, if I focus on the full regression results with this, um, you know, in addition to these network measures being highly predictive of COVID cases, it's equally interesting to see what's not predictive. So it turns out the CMS quality ratings and um, infection violations are completely not predictive. So whether or not a nursing home is, has had um, prior violations has no bearing on its, its um, COVID cases now once you control for these other um, network, um, network measures. Um, the second, or I'll say like the final challenge that we had um, in this is, is, you know, this is, this is very strong evidence, it's very compelling, it is sort of correlational in the sense that any kind of cross-section regression in this case is going to just show us a strong association between connectivity and COVID cases. Um, the thing that we worry about from, from kind of an empirical strategy is, um, is, is sort of like the following story, right? So suppose a nursing home has an outbreak and then a bunch of staff members call in sick or they just decide to not show up to work and then that nursing home has to go and use a temp agency. So it, could that be biasing our results? So it's sort of a reverse causality story that it's the, the, the outbreak that causes the staffing shortages and the temp workers. Um, so that, that is, of course, a possibility. So we really wanted to, to try to explore that by doing something called a time series analysis. Um, this is really our best shot at kind of showing the causal link between 
connectivity and COVID cases. And so the way we do this is first we focus on three states that, that themselves kept very detailed um, um, COVID case counts at the individual nursing home level. Um, and we're looking at a window here from April 19th to August um, 2020. And the three states are Colorado, Connecticut, and Florida. Um, this graph in the bottom just shows you kind of the trends over time. So this is the fraction of all nursing homes in those states that have at least one COVID case. Uh, so we see, for instance, Colorado at the start in April, about 30% of nursing homes had a COVID case, um, and that increased to about 50% over the summer. Um, uh, Connecticut started off kind of the worst, about half of all nursing homes had an outbreak by April, um, and that sort of plateaued. And then we see something like Florida, you know, it started around only 20%, and then really over this summer, it just exploded until in the end, um, nearly 90% of all facilities have had at least one COVID case. So again, we're going we're gonna to sort of make use of the fact that a lot of nursing homes went from never having an outbreak to having their first outbreak over this time period. That's going to be a critical part of this analysis. And what we're doing here is we're interested in when does a nursing home have its first outbreak? So first outbreak I sub, sub IT is facility I has its very first outbreak in time T. And what we're looking at is of all of the nursing homes that are connected to that facility in the two weeks prior to that, did those facilities have outbreaks? So we're allowing for this kind of two week window to allow for the period of infectivity and, and kind of testing um, results and so forth. And so we really want to try to track kind of these outbreaks from this facility to its connected facility um, two weeks later. That's, that's sort of the goal of this analysis. Um, uh, Joseph had a question. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that on, on the last slide. I think what's the difference between um, regressions of one and five. So if I go back here, what, what we're doing here is I'm doing kind of a stepwise regression. So in the first regression, I only include degree. In the second one, I only include strength. In the third one, I only include weighted average neighbor degree. In the fourth one, I include all of those simultaneously. And then in the last one, I include eigenvector centrality. The reason why we separated them out is we think of the first three measures as sort of being local um, network measures. So it it's basically like it, it takes the view if I'm if I'm a nursing home and I just look at my direct kind of neighbors, how connected am I? The eigenvector is the only kind of global metric. So it looks at the entire network and it says you know, how it scores you on a scale of zero to one. How important are you to the overall network within your state? So I, I kind of skipped over that, but think of the first three as sort of local measures of um, connectivity and eigenvector is a more macro level um, of connectivity. Okay, and um, so the results for this, again, the goal of this is to look at this, you know, do we see this kind of leap of infections from one facility to its connected facilities two weeks later? Um, and this first coefficient in blue, it says, yes, it is suggestive of that. If, if one of your connections has, a, has an outbreak two weeks ago, you're about 2% 2 2 more likely to have an outbreak than you otherwise would. And you know, these are percentage points. So you, know, you might go from, um, you know, a, a, for, for instance, like a 6% chance of having something to an 8% chance of having an outbreak. So it's a pretty big jump. What's interesting is in, in yellow, we, we also look at Instead of doing a two week lag, we say, okay, suppose we don't lag it at all. Suppose we just look at concurrent outbreaks. Um, you know, if you have an outbreak now, do any of your current um, connections also have an outbreak? And it's, it's basically, it's kind of like a placebo test where we're, where we're testing, you know, could there be unobservable, let's say covariates that we're just not detecting that's driving these concurrent outbreaks. So, for instance, like this shared ownership structure, or, or there's some other governance that's happening, like the, the nursing home network is requiring, you know, an increase in testing or something like that. You, if that were the case, you would expect there to be a significant correlation between concurrent outbreaks, um, but we don't see any evidence of that. We see, what we do see evidence of is this two-week time delay 
um, which is which is sort of the natural history of, of the of um, the virus in in terms of infection um, time, asymptomatic asymptomatic time, and then eventually you know spreading the disease. So it's it's we think like kind of the strongest evidence that we we can sort of map using this smartphone data. Um, COVID going from one facility to another facility. Uh, so to summarize kind of our, our broad um, findings, we, we look at a number of possible predictors of COVID cases, and we do find things like if a nursing home is for profit, if it has a high share of Black residents, if it's in an urban location, it's more likely to have a higher, a larger outbreak of COVID. Um, but by far the most important um, predictor or the largest um, predictor are connections to other nursing homes. Um, interestingly, what's not predictive are, again, the CMS quality ratings, um, prior infection violations, or the fraction of residents who are receiving Medicaid. Uh, we, we do a, a number of robustness checks. So we, um, in addition to using the CMS data um, for the continental US, we also look at the, the 22 states with much more detailed data and our results um, are robust to that. Um, in addition to counting the number of COVID cases, we, we generate a binary outcome that's just, did you have a COVID outbreak or not? Um, and it's again, robust to that. We, we look at county fixed effects in addition to state fixed effects, and we find, again, re results are robust. And then our time series in these three states, again, provides further evidence that there's something happening um, through kind of the connection of, of nursing homes. Using all of these results, we estimate that, you know, if we could kind of have gone back in time and shut down all shared staff transmission, that COVID cases among residents would be cut by half. So in other words, about half of all COVID cases among residents are attributed to this shared staff um, among, um, sorry, shared um, staff among nursing homes, um, which is an enormous number. And, and like I said, you know, COVID is really starting to resurge again in, in um, a lot of nursing homes due to poor vaccination levels. Um, at the start of the pandemic, some nursing homes in particular, like in Connecticut, um, some of the kind of wealthier nursing homes were effectively able to shut down this um, shared staff. They basically built temporary housing for their for their workers, and they said, "We want you to only work in our facility and not go anywhere else." Um, but of course, that that may not be feasible on kind of a broader scale. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention is we, um, in collaboration between Yale, UCLA, and the U.S. Digital Response, um, we created a web tool um, called ProtectNursingHomes.org. Uh, this is something I'll just give you a quick. Um, snapshot of it. We, we really wanted to, to provide a tool that um, public health departments or nursing homes could use to make sort of quick decisions. Um, so this is just an implementation of, of our smartphone data. And again, if you go to a particular, you can search by location, by county, by state, or by a particular facility. If I go to that facility in Winder, um, Georgia, and I see this is it, um, it, what it does here is it lists all of the connected facilities as well as kind of the strength of that connection. Um, and it presents this as, as kind of a network um, where you, you, know, you see, you can click on any one of these nodes and see, okay, it's highly connected to, um, for example, the Friendship Health Center. And I can click on that one and go from there. And the idea, the kind of the goal of this is um, if there is an outbreak at a facility, um, whether it's COVID or, or another transmissible disease, um, that the, the leadership of that facility could contact other um, neighboring facilities and say, you know, we've had an outbreak here, we need to employ additional testing or PPE or, or whatnot to kind of respond in, in real time. Um, the last thing I'll just kind of mention on this note is you know, this again, this was data that we we used um, kind of near near the start of the pandemic. Um, we we really sped, you know, we kind of joke in, in academia that there's never any research emergencies that like we have the luxury of sort of taking our time. And when we do research, this is one of the few research projects I've been involved with where we we felt like we wanted to go as fast as we could and get as much out as as early as possible. Um, um, since the, the paper has been published, we're now in the process of, um, you know, we have we have a newer set of data from Viraset, um, and we want to go and see how kind of robust are these networks now now that the pandemic has been occurring for a while, um, and the goal is to again provide some kind of more up to date analysis. You know, one challenge with this data is just given the sheer size of it, it 
you know, if we got a new set of data every day, it takes us more than a day to process it. So, so to try to do something purely real time is just not computationally feasible. The best thing I think we could do is to provide maybe periodic updates, like on a monthly or a quarterly basis. Um, we, we have found in some initial analysis that the network, at least, at least in 2020, was, was relatively robust. We didn't see a lot of um, edges kind of forming and dissolving. Um, um, but of course, you know, I think that's an open research question that, that is worth looking at. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there and just see if there's any, uh, any questions um, and happy to, to sort of expand on anything um, if anyone's interested. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elisa. We'll give everybody uh, just a few minutes to punch in any questions. Um, I did realize that I forgot to put um, some of the upcoming events information, so I'm going to drop that in now. So it looks like there's another question from Joseph. Uh, in your time series analysis, was there any, uh, hold on, this one's not pulling up. Is it available on your end? Yeah, it's asking, okay. is there any... Um, is there any non-stationarity detected in any of the time series? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, you know, in the time series, the full period is about 11 weeks. We, we did break it into two kind of five-week periods and looked at the correlation between the first half and the second half of that across networks. And it was pretty high. It was, I think, above 0.8. Um, of course, there's there's going to be, you know, if a temp worker only goes to a, a facility one one time, um, we'll pick that up. But it doesn't mean that that's like a long term um, connection. I, I think like the next step of where it would be worth kind of going is to sort of um, is to sort of further decompose the connections into into kind of stronger ones, like regular people that go back and forth versus sort of like the one time uh, you know, um, offshoot, I, like they, of course, can still transmit COVID. So we wanted to account for that. But, um, you know, again, in the, in the time period that we had, we were doing the thing that we thought would be the most agnostic to time spent, but, but still capture some connectivity. Yeah, it's a great question. There was another question about software. So uh, this was a multi-team effort. So I'm, I'm an R user and my colleagues, Keith and Judy, are Stata uh, they're 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 uh, economists. I'm I'm an engineer by training. So so I did all of the graphics, like the network diagrams and stuff like that. If you're interested, um, that was all in R. There's a package called iGraph that helps you generate them in really cool ways. Um, all of the kind of um, regression and, and other types of analyses we did in Stata. Awesome. Thank you so much for the questions, Joseph. I appreciate it. Um. So I think, um, so Johannes has a question. So, so if you're interested, actually, if you go to um, my colleague, Keith Chen, so we, we have posted a lot of the replication code and data, not the raw data per our data sharing agreement, um, but on the, on the Dataverse website, I think you can get a link to it or I can, I can try to find it um, in a minute, but um, um, you can go and see the, the sort of replication code, meaning the the network measures and things like that um, uh, and so forth. So I'm happy to um, provide that. Or if you shoot me an email, um, uh, I'm happy to, to, to link you to that. Um, sorry, Michael said, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk, I'll do Michael's question and then Abigail. So um, I'll say with the Viraset data, you know, there, there, there is a huge fixed cost to it. So, you know, Keith, you know, Keith and I, I mean, he started working with this back in like 2017. Um, and then, you know, we've been doing a number of papers. Um, I should also mention actually, you know, Keith is my husband. So we, this is one benefit of, of uh, quarantining together is we wrote like three papers together, which was a lot of fun, but um, he really invested heavily in, in both the hardware, you know, he has like a server running in his office and just getting, getting familiar with how to use this and, you know, storing it on AWS and, and stuff like that. Um, so there is a big fixed cost to that, depending on kind of your, your computing um, capabilities and, and things like that. 
Um, now he's gotten it to the point where when, when he gets a new um, batch of data, it's relatively automatic, but taking, going from like the raw data, you know, these, this like, you know, billions of pings into something that's like meaningful, you know, meaning we're filtering out only the pings that appear in these geofences and stuff like that. That was probably the hardest part with, with dealing with it. Once you get to that point, um, then, then it's actually um, much easier to sort of work with. But in some of the other work, like I mentioned, the hurricane stuff, you know, we were, um, we were interested in, you know, when an approaching hurricane is coming, how quickly do people get out of town? Um, and so we were able to filter based on the dates and the location, like, like give me all pings in Florida um, during this two week period. And so that, that also helps um, if, you know, if you can sort of reduce the, the sample size a lot. Um, yes, I will, let me just enter this real quick. If you have questions, this is my email. Um, Abigail, thoughts about searching? I know we're pushing up a little bit against time. So I think we'll take Abigail's question as the last uh, question. However, uh, feel free to post any questions again over on the community side, SafeCraft Data, and I'm happy to follow up with you as well. So, sure. Um, 30 second response to Abigail's question. So, you know, the strategic actions I think are really about, you know, number one, like, we should provide incentives to reduce shared staff employment. So whether that's, you know, subsidizing paying, paying these workers a higher wage. I mean, I think there's a lot of policies, you know, we're doing this kind of more heavy handed approach of requiring vaccinations or facing financial penalty. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem of like workers who are making $20,000 a year and they have to work in multiple facilities. So, I mean, I think there are broader policy um, kind of questions there. Um, the question about the Veriset versus SafeGraph. So to be clear, Veriset is really sort of a spin-off of SafeGraph. The SafeGraph data, I haven't myself worked with the current places data, but my understanding is that it's, it's aggregate data. So it's looking at like the number of people in Los Angeles County who visited a restaurant in the last month, um, that sort of thing. And so it's it's focusing on so-called points of interest and points of interest are usually things like, you know, malls or restaurants or airports or that sort of thing. Nursing homes, unfortunately, do not count as a point of interest. So, so it would not be possible to do this study with, with the existing SafeGraph data. Um, it would have to be kind of the more raw data um, so that we could capture based on the locations of these 15,000 nursing homes which smartphones entered one of those facilities. It's possible that SafeGraph eventually could provide that if they were interested, but as of now, um, there's, there's no data on nursing home entrance and, and especially no data on phones that enter one facility who also enter another facility. Um, and awesome. any other quick questions? Um, again, if, if there's other questions, uh, I'm happy to follow up with everyone. I know, Abigail, I believe uh, I have a call with you in the coming week, so I'm happy to touch base and um, answer any more questions about uh, using SafeGraph data possibly for research as well, so I'm happy to connect offline. But again, big thank you to Lisa. I really appreciate uh, her coming on, and thank you to everyone for attending and, and for some awesome questions. But uh, like I said, we do have a, a great calendar kind of slotted for the rest of September. So we hope to see you soon and otherwise have a great rest of the week. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all.